it's time for perspective, and it's one of the defining features of a human being, walking upright on two feet. But what's largely taken for granted by many is the subject of a fascinating new book by our next guest, neuroscientist Shane O'Mara, who's also professor of experimental brain research at Trinity College, Dublin. Now his bestseller, in praise of walking, dives into the many benefits of taking a stroll. Now, thank you very much for being with us on the program. Now, my first question really is, why do you describe in your book um, walking as a superpower? Why walking as opposed to, say, other forms of physical activity? Uh, I describe walking as a superpower because it's our unique adaptation as humans. And if you consider how humans conquered the planet when we walked out of Africa 100,000 years ago, we literally did that. Uh, and uh, we got ourselves all the way to South America. We got ourselves all the way to New Zealand. And we didn't do it using mechanized transport. We did it on foot, walking in small tribal and family groups. Now, you support the idea that the brain evolved to support movement and that if we stop moving, it stops working as well. Then what do you make of this sort of societal shift in modern times of people becoming more sedentary, glued to their desks, glued to their phones, etc.? What does that mean for a society as a whole? I, I think this kind of we have to be fair to humans here. We, we evolved in a landscape that was resource poor. Uh, but at the same time, we evolved to walk considerable distances every day, uh, anything up to 15, 18 kilometers a day, day in, day out. Uh, the problem is we have we have solved the problem of food access uh, pretty much in the Western world. But we have not designed our societies to facilitate movement. And uh, we know that uh, lack of movement contributes to all sorts of problems in the brain and all sorts of problems in the body, from things like uh, silting up the heart to respiratory problems uh, to a series of malign changes in the brain. Now, you say that one of the reasons why people move less is because cities and urban areas don't necessarily accommodate or prioritize pedestrians. You know, what do you think urban planners should do to get people out there walking? I, I think th this is a difficult question and it's not easy to answer what or to give the exact answer to. I think the problem comes down to how do we want to organize our towns and cities? Uh, you know, you take the, the beautiful old medieval cities of, of Europe. Uh, we can't pour cars into them. They're not designed for cars. So I think what we have to do actually is engage in, in widespread car banning, which is something that people are very uncomfortable with. But I think this is the, uh, in the end, removal of on-street parking and the simple removal of private cars from the cities is the best way forward. Now, you've also said in your book that um, there are certain positive traits like openness and extroversion and just general agreeableness, um, a link to increased activity levels. Can you just tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so we have very good data now on what happens to people who are sedentary and people who are active. And uh, the study you're referencing is a, a wonderful study uh, conducted in Wisconsin over the last 30 years. And what they've shown very, very nicely is that the people who move the least show the most malign changes in their personality. They become less agreeable, they become less open to experience, and they become more introverted. But for every level of movement above the most sedentary, you see positive uh, aspects of personality being changed. People are more agreeable, which means they get on better together. They're more extroverted, so they're able to talk to each other. And uh, they're open to the experience, uh, which is a, a really important dimension of personality that feeds into creativity. And speaking of creativity, you say as well that creativity get, gets a boost by physical activity. So if we were to, I don't know, do, say, 100 push-ups before solving a particularly difficult maths problem, would that improve our performance? So um, it, I think, you know, if we look at the, the lessons of the great artists uh, and creatives over the years, uh, what you see is many of them uh, were really, really uh, great walkers and walked considerable distances prior to engaging in creative acts. Uh, and uh, if I was to give you a very, very simple laboratory task, you know, bring you into the lab and hand you something like a common household object, like a paperclip, and ask you to come up with novel uses for that object, uh, you might come up with 10 or 20 uh, such uses. But if I ask you to do a short walk first of about 10 minutes duration, either around a defined arena or on a treadmill, and then ask you to do the same task, your ability to generate ideas about doubles. So what we know is that a period of prior movement before engaging in creative work 
actually facilitates creative problem solving. So don't sit at your desk banging your head off your laptop. Get up, go for a walk, go for a stroll, come back, and then you'll find the problem much easier to tackle. Now, I just wanted to ask, I mean, you've obviously researched this book before uh, publishing, you know, these stories. What for you has been sort of the surprise takeaway from all of your research? I, I think the, the big surprise for me has been uh, this realization that walking evolved in a social context. Uh, I think it, it's really quite remarkable that uh, we focused very, very much on the idea uh, of individual walking, how our spines changed, how our the, the morphology of our foot changed, that kind of thing. But actually, for humans to have conquered the planet, we had to have learned and we had to have adapted to walking together in small groups, being able to pay shared social attention to each other. Um, and walking has been sculpted by that uh, experience. We're very, very good at paying attention to small groups. We're very good at paying joint attention to the horizon. And when we need to coordinate our behavior together, when the groups get a little bit bigger, uh, we do things like sing, we chant, we tell stories, we march in formation. So humans are astonishingly good in a way that other species aren't at synchronizing uh, their behavior uh, and at synchronizing walking uh, over very, very long distances. And just finally, what's your advice for people who, you know, like myself, don't move enough, are welded to their couch, just simply don't have the time or the energy after work, for example, to go out there and take a walk? What would you tell us to sort of motivate us to get out there? So the, uh, the first thing is that people underestimate consistently how good they feel after a walk. Um, so uh, if you take a walk, even if you don't feel like taking it, write down uh, on a scale of one to five how you think you'll feel and then write down when you come back how you actually do feel. And what you find is regularly, reliably, uh, that people feel much better than they estimated they would feel. So keep that in mind. A walk will make you feel good. The other thing you should do is track the number of steps that you make every day uh, and uh, have a target and have that as your kind of goal to action, whether it's 10,000 steps, 12,000, 8,000, it doesn't matter. Just have a goal and increment that goal. And then finally, um, if you're taking public transport or if you're driving, park further away, get off the uh, train a little bit earlier. Um, and uh, if you're going out for lunch, walk to a further cafe um, so that you just add a little bit in everywhere you go. Don't take the elevator, take the stairs. Uh, just simple changes like that can make a huge difference. But what we need is the other side. We need uh, uh, our urban planners to recognize that walking is our evolved form of movement and to recognize that in our urban centers. Shane Amara, I'll be taking your advice. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today.